Hey guys, my name is Jesse Humphrey and today we're going to take you through how to make a moving platform in Unreal Engine 5. I've seen a couple videos about how to do this and to be honest, I'm not going to name any names, but they weren't that great. Uh, so I wanted to make this uh, because I think that this method is a little bit more reusable. It's good for designers. It's also good for blocking out larger levels uh, because it's highly reusable uh, and also a bit forward thinking. So wanted to uh wanted to put this out just to just to get you guys uh something that is uh high utility and high reuse so we are working in unreal engine 5.0.3 this is the first person template project as you can see the first person template uh, i've moved the player start up to this platform let's go ahead and give that a little rotate okay uh, we're going to put our platforms up here. So we want to be able to just press play and, and see these things working. Okay. So we're going to do a few things before we actually get into programming our platforms. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a debug material and you'll see what we're going to use that for later. So to kind of just block out what we want here, we want a moving platform that's going to move from a known position A to a known position B. And we want to be able to determine what that position B is in the viewport without having to go back into uh, the class and define that. Uh, so we also want to determine how long it's going to take to move from position A to position B uh, in a very uh, understandable manner so that it's easy for it's easy to explain to a designer or another programmer. This is what this number means. And we also want to visualize where our position B is. So just keep all those things in mind as we move forward with this. So we look in our content folder. I've made a folder here called materials and I've made another called blueprints. These are going to be the two folders that I've constructed. I don't think that you'll have them in your project. We're going to start with a material and I'm going to right click and make a material. We're going to call it M underscore debug in accordance with Unreal Standard. Inside of here, we're going to go to a translucent blend mode, all right? And I'm going to hold four and left click. That's going to give me a constant four vector, okay? Basically just a color with an alpha channel. And I'm going to right click and convert that to a parameter. I'll explain why in a minute if you don't already understand. Uh, I'm going to drag the color into emissive color here. And I'm going to hold S and left click to get myself a scalar and call that uh, we'll call that alpha. Now we could use the alpha from the color here for the opacity instead of just this, but it's it's just a little bit easier to use this alpha. So we're gonna link that up and I'm gonna set that default value to 0.75 over there. And we're gonna set the default color to red. All right, nice and easy. All right. So let's actually start working on our platform. We're going to open up blueprints and actors. Okay. We're going to make a new blueprint class that inherits from the actor type. I'm going to call it BP underscore moving platform again in, in, uh, in line with the unreal standard. We're going to pop that open. We only really need for the moment two static meshes. So we're going to do one static mesh. We're going to call that platform. We're going to set that to be the uh, SM cube. Uh, now, one issue we're going to encounter, and I'll explain what the you know what this issue will result in later, is that the handle point for this is on the corner. I think for the chamfered cube, it's in the center. Um, so you could do it this way if you want to. Um, but the the I, I kind of just like the SM cube better, uh, but we'll take a look at it with the chamfered cube later. So we've got our platform and we're going to do static mesh again. Uh, and this is going to be our debug. OK, now our debug is going to be a child of the platform. All right. So we've got platform and we've got debug. We are not going to set the static mesh for the debug here. OK. All right. So in our construction script, what we're going to do is we're going to take the debug. We're going to set static mesh and we're going to set it to the value of the platforms get static mesh. OK, 
okay? Boom, nice and easy. Now, the reason that we're doing that is so that no matter what we change the platform static mesh to, the debug will follow suit. So let's grab that debug. Let's go ahead and move this out, okay? Already you can see that it's it's pasted that mesh, but if we change this to chamfer cube, boom! See, it copies it right over. We don't have to do anything extra, okay? So it takes care of that for us, which is kind of what you want from a debug mesh. Okay, so we're gonna compile and save. I'm going to reset that positioning there. Okay. We want to do one extra thing with this debug. So we're going to take the debug and we're going to get num materials. And the reason we're doing this is because if this platform, like if you use a different static mesh, let's say you get something off of the marketplace, maybe that static mesh has more than one material slot. So we want to override the materials for each slot to be the debug material we just created because otherwise it's gonna it's gonna look odd so we're gonna get the number of materials we're gonna do a for loop not a for each loop a for loop index is gonna be zero and the last index is going to be uh the number of materials minus one because you know with with iteration like this there's always an off by one error so if there's one material in this debug, then you're going to get one back, which means we need to just do the loop over zero, and that's it. Uh, I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, just drop a comment and I'll explain it. If anything in this video doesn't make sense, be sure to drop a comment and I'll do what I can to explain it. Okay, so now we're going to take that debug. We want to set material, which will set the material on the static mesh. We're going to set the element index of the current index of the for loop. So if we're on loop zero, it will set the zero index. So that's nice and easy. And then for material, we're going to use our debug material. So if we compile and save, this should already be working. See, no problem. Easy peasy, right? So now we have a debug cube there. I'll explain what we'll use it for in a minute. Uh, construction script, there we go. Uh, completed. I'm going to go ahead and put a reroute in here. Okay. So what we're going to need to do is get a position in the world that we want to move to, right? So we want to figure out, okay, where are we going to move this platform to? So the first thing we need is a variable and we'll call it the move to transform. Now we're gonna use transforms for a specific reason because we wanna be able to put in rotation data as well as location data, not just location data. So we're not just gonna use a vector. We wanna use a transform, okay? The other reason is, oh, nope, that's actually not a good reason. So never mind. okay. So we need to make that move to transform instance editable and show 3D widget. We're gonna use the 3D widget to set the position that we want to move to in the world, in this level editor. Uh, we're also gonna set that category to platform so it will show up for us. All right, so the next thing we need, we need to know what our start and end points are gonna be. We wanna know that before we even do begin play. So we're gonna create two new transform variables. This is going to be our starting transform. That is going to be uh, da, 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 private. Because no, no class outside of this needs to see that. So let's go ahead and make it private. And then we are going to make an ending transform. And we're gonna make that private as well. All right, so we've got three transforms here. So our starting transform, we need to go ahead and set this. This is going to be the return from get actor transform. So we're getting the actor's location in the world and we are going to set our starting transform to that. Okay, so wherever we drop this actor, boom, that's our starting transform, nice and easy, okay? But now we need to get our ending transform. So we're gonna set ending transform and we need to make the transform because we got to do a couple of things first. So there's one of two ways you could do this. You could either get this from the starting transform or the get actor transform. It doesn't really matter. Let's just break it out from here. 
So we're going to break that starting transform. And then we're also going to break our move to transform. Okay. So the move to transform is a relative transform. If you, if we go ahead and drop this actor in, we're not even close to ready, but if we go ahead and drop this actor in, you see we've got this location data. We've got this transform data. Okay, this is where we are in the world. This is the world rotation, and this is our scale. But you'll note that the move to transform is actually zeroed out. There's no location, no rotation, and a default scale of one. If we move that transform, and you pay attention over here, you can start to see it move. Okay, but this transform up here is not moving because the actor is staying in place, but this move to transform, this little relative transform that we have is changing because it's relative. So if we add 210 to 1920, we're gonna get this location, okay? In, a, in if we add a relative transform of that, of that amount. So let's zero that out. So all we need to do is combine these locations. We're going to combine the location of the starting transform and the move to transform. That will get us that point in the world we want to move to. The other thing we need to do is combine the rotations so that if we add any rotation um, into our move to destination, then we'll also account for that rotation during the movement which we'll see. It'll look a little wonky the way that we're doing this now with the model we're using, uh, but that'll be fine. And then we're just gonna use the scale from the original actor. We're not gonna deal with any kind of scaling issues here uh, because that's, that's a bit relative as well. Okay, so we have the ending transform. Now what we wanna do is we need our debug to reflect the actual location in the world with the mesh so that we can appropriately position the move to transform in a way that makes sense with our with our mesh. So we're going to get our debug and we're going to set relative transform. There we go. And it's going to be the value of the move to transform. So if the move to transform is completely zeroed out, then the debug is going to be here, dead center, okay? No matter what we do. I think if we try to move it, it won't move. Yeah, see, it's not it's not moving. No matter what our number is here, we can't move it. Go ahead and reset that anyway. So let's see that in action. If we move this move to transform, so you can see that little 3D widget there. When you click on it and it turns a little bit brighter, that's when you know you have it selected. If we move that, to be clear, we only have the move to transform selected. If we move that, the debug follows it. Okay, and that allows us to move this everywhere. And then we can see when we'll be colliding with some other geometry. Okay, so it kind of helps us debug what that position means relative to the mesh that we're using and the actor's placement so that we can put that move to transform in the right place in the level so that it looks good. All right. Uh, another thing I'm going to do is actually shorten that Z. Uh, 0 0.5 on that Z. How about half of that again? 0 0.25. Okay. So I made the platform 0 0.25 on the Z scale just to give it that more platformy look. And the debug followed it because it's, it's relative scale, location, rotation, and all that. Okay, so our construction script, I think, is done. Let me move that here and there. Okay, um, a couple more things. I actually just remember that we need to do with that debug. We need to set the collision preset to no collision. We need to set hidden in game to true. And we also wanna set that to is editor only. We don't need the debug in a packaged build. It's only for designers at design time. It shouldn't influence any of the gameplay. It shouldn't influence any of the behavior. It should only reflect enough to let the designers know what they're doing, okay? All right, so we're gonna destroy these, uh, these two nodes. We do not need the tick and we do not need begin overlap. 
So we're going to go ahead and get rid of those. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a timeline. We're going to use a timeline to move us back and forth, but we're going to do something a little special with the timeline so that we can get some cool behavior that we can design later. So if we right click, I'm just going to type timeline and add a timeline. I'm going to call this platform move underscore TL. Just to be clear that this is a timeline because you can see it over here. All right, we'll open that up. I'm going to make the length of the track one. I'm going to add a new float track. I'm going to call this alpha because we're going to use this as an alpha for a lerp. I'm going to add a key curve float and then I'm going to add another. I'm going to make sure that this one is set to zero, zero and this one is set to one and one. And then what I'm going to do, if we click on this and right click, we're going to set it to auto. So we get this really nice ease in and ease out. Okay, makes it really pretty when it does move. So that's all done. We're, we're done. We don't need to edit the timeline anymore. That should be fine. Just check length of one, zero, zero, one, one. Perfect. Okay, let's deal with this half. Let's deal with the ending half of the uh, timeline first. So we are going to set actor transform. So the whole actor is going to move on this update tick, okay? From the new transform, we're going to drag out, I'm going to type lerp. We're going to get a lerp uh, for two transforms here. Plug in that little alpha pin there. And you can leave this to quat interp. Uh, don't use Euler interp because you could get some gimbal lock if you're doing a bit more fancy rotation stuff. Uh, leave that to quat interp and just, you know, put that away. Okay, so we're only going to have to lerp between uh, two transforms. Then it should be simple to figure out which ones. We're going to lerp between our starting transform and our ending transform. Okay. But this only works in one direction at the minute. So if we play this timeline, we're going to update, we're going to alert from our starting transform, which is our starting position, to the end. But we also need to get it back round to go the other way. So if we drag out from the direction pin and use a switch statement and hook that up, we can prep for uh, getting it to loop back. We're not going to physically loop it back because that's dirty. You don't want to do that. Uh, also because you need to be able to interrupt that uh, as necessary. So what we're going to do, we're going to add some custom events here. So this is the start platform move. And that's going to be on the play pin. And then we're going to add a custom event. Oops. Custom event for stop platform move. Boom. Stop. And then we're going to add another custom event and custom event for reverse platform move. And that's going to be on the reverse pin. The reason we're using play and reverse rather than play from start and reverse from end is because if you want to stop in the middle of that movement and then resume, you know, moving forward or backward, you want to make sure that you play or reverse from that point in the timeline rather than resetting it so that you don't get any odd behavior. So now that we have that, let's let's figure out how we're going to actually come back and restart our loop. So if we finished the timeline and we were moving forward, that means we need to reverse now, right? Moving forward means we, we ran start platform move. It's moving to its destination. Now it's done and we need it to move back. So we need to call reverse platform move. Boom, perfect. And then likewise, if we were moving backward, back to the starting point, we now need to move to the ending point. So we need to call start platform move. Boom, perfect. And now we're done with our timeline. That's it. It is that simple, okay? Now there's a couple other things that we want to do as kind of quality of life or designer considerations. And one of them is we need to be able to change how long it takes to move from point A to point B. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a look at our platform and make sure that it works. 
So what should happen is that it should take it should take this platform one second because the timeline is of length one. It should take the platform one second to move from here to our endpoint and then one second to move back. So let's check. It is not moving and I know why. <laughs> Very anticlimactic. On begin play, let's go ahead and call start platform move. Oh, this happens all the time. Always miss something simple. Okay, let's try now. One, two, three, four. Yeah, that's about a second. So it's working and it's moving back and forth, okay? And it doesn't appear to be breaking. So that's, you know, that's ideal. Okay, but now what if we want to change that length? Well, one thing you could do is come in here and set the length to something different, change the second key, but that's not very reliable because then if you want two platforms moving at different speeds, you need to create a child of this class and, and do this all over again. And that's not a good idea. So here's what we're gonna do instead. We're going to add a variable called duration and it's going to be a float value. Now there is one extra thing you need to do here. Firstly, we're gonna make this blueprint read only. You shouldn't be setting this when the game is running. We need to make sure the slider and value ranges are a minimum of 0.1. And then go ahead and set the default value to 0.1. Now what that does is it makes it impossible for any other programmer or designer to accidentally type in something like negative 20 because it just resets it to 0 0.1, okay? Uh, we're gonna set that category to um, platform as well. We're gonna make a function called set uh, move duration. Okay, let's drag that timeline component and do a get, and then we're going to set play rate. All right, so set play rate basically sets the speed at which this timeline will play. So we need to figure out a way to get, uh, to be able to change that speed, but in a very understandable way. So let's drag out from this. We're gonna do, I'm just gonna type the slash and we'll get this divide function here. We're gonna do that. On the top pin, you need to type one. We're just gonna do one divided by, and then we're gonna get our duration. So one divided by our duration is our new play rate. Now really quickly, I'm going to explain kind of the math on how this works, okay? So you wanna think of duration as the number of seconds. So let's pretend that our default here is 10, okay? So one divided by 10, will give us 0 0.1, okay? Our timeline is one second. So one divided by 0 0.1 is 10. That's how many seconds our timeline will last because the play rate means, you know, you're, you're playing at a rate of 0 0.1. That's the result of our function here. One divided by 10 is 0 0.1. So the play rate is 0 0.1, which means you divide the length by the play rate. And since our play rate is 0 0.1, one divided by 0 0.1 is 10. We get back our duration, which means we can consider our duration as a number of seconds from, you know, moving from the starting to the ending point. So in that sense, it's really easy to explain to a designer or to another programmer how that number works. Duration is literally just the number of seconds that you want from the starting to the ending point. And before we start the platform, we need to actually call this set move duration. Otherwise, that's not going to freaking work. Okay, so now we're setting the move duration. We're starting the platform. So if we come into this world here, uh, why is my, oh, it needs to be instance editable. I swear, I always forget something. Make that instance editable. Perfect. So now our duration is actually present in our viewport here. 
So just to show why this is so easy, we can, if I uh, hold Alt and drag from here, I will duplicate that actor. I'm gonna set that to six and this is at 10, okay? So to be clear, we've changed nothing except that value, okay? And we can already see how these platforms move differently. They move at a different speed. And all you had to do was change that value. And this is so much more modular. This is so much easier to use than some of the platforms I've seen in these in these other tutorials. And that's kind of why I wanted to make this because this is, this is something I think people will get a lot of use out of. And this is how you can develop these platform puzzles. So if we stop this, you can also add a little bit of uh, rotation to your move to transform here. So let's say we wanna make it roll 180. And then because it's at the corner here, we actually have to do a little bit of weird movement. Oops. We'll test this with the chamfered cube in just a second. But this should rotate on its way over there. Yeah, see now, like I said, it's odd because of where the rotation point, where that, uh, where that handle point is on this particular uh, static mesh. So let's take a second to turn this into the chamfered cube, which has a, uh, it's the, the handle point is in the center. See, so now all of these things are wrong. So we got to redo these. Oh goodness, we have to redo all of this. Okay, let's just, let's just delete that. <laughs> Sometimes that's just easier. Nice. And then we will get that move to transform. Treat it basically the same way. And then I'll go ahead and duplicate. Now, if we take that and we want to spin it, let's say, let's say 270. Let's get a good, let's get a good rotation out of that. Oh, that's odd. Okay, it just spun the other way. That's fine. It didn't go off axis like the previous one did. So that's just to show you that you know the that rotation behavior looked odd because of the. Um, that handle point being at the corner. Uh, so hopefully that was that was helpful for you guys. Hopefully you guys can find a lot of utility out of that. Uh, just to be clear, these don't have to move in a straight line either. Uh, you can you can put this stuff anywhere and it'll just it'll just go. You know, it'll just go where you tell it, uh, which is super useful. Uh, so hopefully that was a good example for you guys. Hopefully you guys can get a, a little bit of utility out of that. If you have any questions or any suggestions or anything that you think I might have missed, feel free to leave a comment and uh, let me know if I helped you out, okay? Thank you guys so much for checking out this video and I'll see you next time.